Thank you. Um, so this is this is kind of an interesting, interesting little collection of uh, of talks. You know, looking at it not just from a technology side of things, but also from an experience side of things. There's like a level of embedded knowledge in a lot of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, but now how can we take that yet at a larger scale and go further down the road? What I mean by that is that, you know, you have, take the most senior person in your office, they probably have 50 years worth of experience, right? <clears throat> the next person, to come down the line, we'll probably also have 50 years worth of experience. So we need to continue to grow that. Unless we can you know, live to, a, you know, we're 120 or something like that and continue to work that, that 50 years will only inch its way slowly. But also the, uh, the, the vastness of knowledge that we can, we can hold is, is somewhat limited. So thinking about the profession and thinking about the, the experiences, um, the first question I would pose to you folks is, how can we harness a lot of, the, how can we go broader and how can we go deeper so that we can make the experiences of the future better than the experiences of today? Is there a switch on there? Or? Or the microphone? I know it's not loud, but people yeah. watching hey. won't hear it, so. Hey, there we go. Okay. Are we good? good? We're good. Okay. That sounds good. Uh, I, I'll just jump in with this. We, um, I have a member of my team who's six months away from retiring. Um, and he's been in the industry for just decades, lots of experience. When I start off as, as an architect, um, I learned detailing from one of these people who drew everything sketch by hand. And I was putting it into AutoCAD and later make MicroStation at that point. And, um, you know, I, I think for me, the experiences we're running into now with this member of my team is that he's actually spent a lot of energy learning the new ways things are being done so they can actually meet at a middle point, a middle ground to communicate with each other. So for example, he, you know, he does work with uh, model airplanes and helicopters and inventor and does 3D printing at home. Um, he also has been writing some of his own code. So he can start to learn a bit of that language of the next generation, so that the next generation can also meet him at a midway point. So what I've actually been finding is that um, the, the conversations we've been getting into have been really interesting. Um, we've been finding common points of conversation for that knowledge to get offloaded. We've also just been going through the process of literally having him sit down once a week and do an interview with a member of our team to be able to document that information and convert it back. But it's also been trying to take a lot of that institutional knowledge, a lot of that tacit knowledge, a lot of those experiences and where we can build it into our systems and make sure that when we build it into our systems, we're communicating the reason why that exists there. It's not just a standard that, you know, oh, there's like a, a little hidden tag in the code that says this is from Glenn's brain, right? Um, instead, it's actually like an, an honest reason why this exists and there's an explanation of it. So it's both pulling that information out, getting it into a way that the next generation understands, building it into a tool, but also making sure we're communicating, the, an, answering the question why. Otherwise, it's really way too easy for the next, next generation to be like, oh, that's just how the old guys did it in the past. Yeah, I'll follow up on that. I mean, the, the timber project that I showed is a great example of this. And, you know, the, the goal of that was education. It wasn't to automate a design process that we're doing and we need to do faster. It was to take some knowledge that a few people in the organization had and try and spread it out, right? And uh, it's it's been tough, I think, for Core Studio working with these domain experts historically, because at the beginning it was kind of like, who are these people? Are recovered architects that code? What? How can you help me with my engineering work, right? Uh, but I think we we've sort of been incrementally, very very slowly developing trust in the organization that this skill set has a lot of value too. And that the combination of these two, uh, it's actually greater than the sum of their, their parts. So it's a it's hard work, you know, like different mindsets, different communication patterns, uh, but uh, again, really, really productive when you can couple those two skill sets. Yeah, I think there was an aspect of this in each of the presentations this morning, but um, I think especially in, in Shane's, um, focusing on, you know, not the, 
the tool so much or the in the kind of specialty of the plumbing, but focusing more on the conversation and the culture. Um, you know, one of the things that that we're trying to implement at Handel is to think about the way that we talk about computation and using the idea of an algorithm. So more algorithmic thinking and more algorithmic speaking, instead of focusing on, oh, I connect this thing and it does this thing, sort of like, this is the design intent. These are the high level steps and anybody can engage in that conversation. Um, you know, it's a, you can, you can engage with that as a senior level partner who knows nothing about the individual technology. And um, it, leads to a, a culture of exploration, I think, and um, is valuable in that way. I want to I want to pass this question off to uh, Hiroshi. Um, you know, within the you you mentioned within your presentation that um, the the Japanese uh, culture is uh, the AEC culture specifically is going through some shifts where the the craftsmanship or, or the, the the level the number of master craftsmen uh, are slowly dwindling over the years, and you know technology is uh, moving forward, but we're not adopting so fast. So with such you know within uh, the Japanese culture, there's deep roots and many formal kind of defined methods and and operations and so on. How can you implement such a large shift? You know with your uh, digital design uh, efforts there to help bring your uh, your firm, your firm in the forefront. There's also a translator on the other end helping out too. So, え、聞こえますか。Yes, we can hear you now. Yep. Sorry. Uh, では質問に答えます。えっと、そうですね。え、変える First of all, it is difficult to change. Uh, however, uh, digital transformation is inevitable, and the top management is strongly committed to this. And this is actually driving our overall organization to move forward to the digital uh, change now. Continuing. Well, using digital uh, technology is not really for uh, the uh, workers themselves. Uh, they are doing that to benefit the subsequent uh, processes. That is the reason why the penetration has been quite slow. Yes. But in case of Japanese general contractors, uh, the benefits uh, can be enjoyed at the organizational level, and that is really a big advantage that we actually are observing right now. Um, that's all. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, so what does, you know, with the ever-growing technology and the, the rapid evolution of how we live in society, um, especially the last two years, I always say that the last two years really fast forwarded us by five years, uh, supply chain management, communications, remote learning, all sorts of things like that. As all of this evolves, as our world evolves, as we evolve, as our industry evolves, what does the architect of the future need to know? 
what are new things that they need to know that we don't know today? I mean, it's kind of a tricky question there. What do you think they would need to know? Empathy. <laughs> I, I, it's, um, it's interesting because I, I think we've been taught a lot of these things already. We, we've gone through, I mean, this is broader than just architecture, this is in engineering, this is into every parts of the practice, but like it's, um, it's a perspective that our domain as architects is number one, not just creating drawings that someone else builds. Number two, it's actually not making buildings, it's making experiences. It's making um, spaces and collections of spaces that serve a particular program that the client wants, that the public wants, that the whole planet needs. Um, and in so doing, given the last two years and what we've seen, and I know probably a lot of us involved in technology were all of a sudden called in a year and a half ago to hurry up and do a whole lot of things to digitize processes, how people talk and communicate. It's why we have you know, people on these uh, video sessions with us now. Um, there's a whole lot of that really fast has happened. But what I think we're also starting to recognize is that that infusion of technology is also fundamentally changing our relationship to physical space or our relationship to other people. Um, technology infusing into physical space, properties and ideas and affordances of physical space infusing into technology, it's been going on for a long time. So I think what I start to think back to is Many, many years ago, what was happening in the 50s, 60s, 70s, these sorts of conversations, there's a really good book by Molly Wright Steenson called Architectural Intelligence, where she goes back to the early work of Christopher Alexander. She talks with you know, Richard Saul Werman for, uh, and especially Cedric Price. I really get excited thinking about the things that Cedric Price was thinking about in this front. And I think we're starting to the point where as architects, as designers, as engineers, we start to think about the broader ways at which our design process and uh, can ultimately have an impact on building with that infusion of technology and that transition over from the idea of buildings and spaces as static things that we inhabit to instead as being learning systems as, as vibrant active entities. Well, I'm not sure we quite have yet as a design environment or a simulation environment that properly gives us access to understanding what that means. Um, but I think no matter what technology we need to learn to get there, going back to some of our innate human behaviors and understandings of other people and how we work with other people, that's where we have to start from again. I don't know if this counts as, as knowledge per se, but I think there's a certain perspective shift that that should or, or sort of needs to happen from viewing these tools as like some specialty domain of like a few experts to viewing them as kind of the water that we swim in, you know, that, that, that there needs to be a sort of broad facility and comfort with, you know, being able to pick up multiple tools and put them down the way that like, I don't know, my generation uses social networks, right? And interfaces, we're just sort of comfortable and can jump in and figure them out and plug things together and you know we know how to comport ourselves um and i i think over the next decade you know 15 years or so as a, as the industry continues to evolve we need to see that kind of behavior happen across our tools as well where we don't view them as separate but we view them as kind of uh the water yeah the water we swim in you know that we can grab something to do embodied carbon and then sort of tweak it a little bit or hack it into something else. And that's not seen as a specialty um, super user power. It's just a normal day's work. Composition, you said tools should be able to be composed into something more, right? I love that. It's like trying to encourage and participate in this ecosystem. And I think like props to McNeil for doing like all the way along like walking that walk, of like encouraging that in the ecosystem and more and more open sourcing a lot of their tools. I think there's a lot to learn from them. Just one quick thing to note, and I, I wanna applaud both of you and even you know, Hiroshi at the Shimizu Corporation, the effort that everyone has been taking here to 
um, spread that knowledge around, to get everybody speaking that language, to understand it, to infuse it in their design process. That's the biggest impact. I'm super happy that McNeil and all the other companies and everybody making APIs to connect tools up are doing that because that goes along with it. But it's the people side that's going to ultimately end up mattering. So I, I think like if there's one kind of takeaway I've gotten from this morning, it's not just from my talk, it's that the work that all everybody up here are doing right now is very much focused on the people side of that. There's definitely kind of this, this idea of understanding first principles, right? So bringing that, that, that knowledge base with you and then embedding it into tools and, uh, and then allowing the user to add a layer of intelligence on it versus a tool trying to be intelligent for you, which we've all kind of arm wrestled a little bit here and there. Every time we see an, an error message saying your constraint is going to be broken or you know some sort of red flag or something like that. How do you think that um, a lot of these kind of endpoints and a lot of this embedded knowledge in these applications, do you still think it'll allow us to have platforms where we can embed knowledge on top of it? Or do you think it's going to become these platforms that be, you know tell us we can't constrain this or can't constrain that? Well, I like the quote from Casey Reese about um, not only being able to remix and reuse tools, but to change them and the necessity, the, the like, you, you need to be able to change tools to be able to make them do what you want. And I think to get to that point, it's a, it's a long, it's a, it's a tough one, but um, you, you do need that sort of agency as a skill set. You have to be able to act, you have to be able to create change. And if, if not, um, I think you're, you're always going to be hamstrung to some degree. I think some of this comes back to a little bit of what I was talking about, where the less you actually understand what the tool is doing, um, the less resistance it gives you, the less you understand, um, it starts to de-skill you. And this is, I mean, this is an idea that comes a little bit out of uh, Richard Sennett's book, The Craftsman, where he talks about the importance of resistance. And he talks about specifically like with instruments and how you learn that instrument. But also it's, it's the same thing with any sort of tool that you make, any system that you end up making. You can embed a lot of knowledge into it, but there's a benefit to the resistance. There's a benefit also to understanding what it's actually doing so that you can engage in that thought process. That's why I'm a little concerned about some of the black box scenarios that are out there. I'm super excited about the opportunities through AI, generative approaches, machine learning, all that kind of stuff. Um, if it's something that the in in the total combination of our work and the work of it ultimately you know takes us into new places, um, but uh, yeah, I, I I kind of I get excited when you where when you encounter some of that resistance, some of that exploration, some of that challenge, and it ultimately helps you to think about some new ideas and approaches in your design. Yeah, the other side of that, I'll quote another person at this VIP event last night. Greg Schlissner was there and said, give me a black box to tell me when I'm wrong. So kind of a different like request. I think may maybe both are valid to some degree. You know, maybe there are moments when you just need to know right or wrong so you can push ahead. But I think you're right too, Shane, that like you need to be able to dive in for explanations. Otherwise, I think you're right that there is this risk of being de-skilled, just taking advantage or taking for granted somebody else's knowledge and not asking, is that right? Does that actually make sense? Right. By the way, I have to catch myself because I'm happy to be proven wrong on this or <laughs> someone to challenge me because, or, or to, yeah, to, to discover something entirely new because, you know, with that constant anthropocentric view of AI, I always assume it's going to think the same way that we're going to think. Therefore, it can give me an explanation that I can even understand it might never be able to give me an explanation. And to that point, if the result is good enough or better than I would have come up with, who am I to say, yeah. right? So I, I have to check myself because I, I said all that, but I could also be disagreeing with it. So I'm gonna be contradictory. Anyway. <laughs> I think that's one of the nice things about like a human in the loop design pattern, right? Is that you don't necessarily need to peer into the fine plumbing of it, but you can, make an intuitive understanding based on the atomicness of the steps, right? You can kind of understand, I put this in and this came out. And I I'm pretty sure what's happening is more or less this, um, which is actually, 
um, sort of, you know, related to, to Charlie's question in, in preparing for this talk, I posted some some clips online of like, you know, doing the extraction process. And one of the junior designers who has since left Handel was like, wow, this is incredible. I wish I had this, you know, uh, knowledge available while I was starting to learn how to do unit planning, um, that I could basically ping a model and see a bunch of layouts and then use those as a starting point to work from, not as a replacement for his knowledge, but as a way to sort of connect to some of that um, institutional and and develop long-term knowledge. Um, obviously, senior people are sort of in short supply and high demand. And so exporting some of their expertise and knowledge and previous solutions into this other environment where junior designers can kind of query it to their heart's content, similar to what TT is doing, I think is really smart. It lets, it lets those people kind of interrogate and play and train themselves in a way that is really, really cool. One more note, the, the part, if you can find people who are trusted at the level of the institution and connect yourselves with them, you can skip a lot of the steps, right? Like we, we work with uh, a couple of engineers who have like, you know, kind of a rep in Thornton Tomasetti of being like the, the person or something. It's like, okay, well, if you're, if, if they say it's good, then it's like, again, it, so that, that maybe that's a model for like, I think that's more easily attainable than teach everybody to code and make everything open source within your organization. That that's a little further off. So uh, again, that partnership model has been really successful. TT. We have a question coming in uh, from the remote, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, this one's specifically for Matt. Um, what is the role of Rhino Hops? What is the mechanism to connect Revit and TensorFlow? The mechanism to control Rhino Hops uh, through to use Rhino Hops to connect TensorFlow and Revit. Mm -hmm. So Hops Hops basically connects. You know, it's it's sort of that little bridge diagram, right? Hops connects to Flask. Flask connects to TensorFlow, um, and Hops on the other side connects to the Grasshopper environment, and through Rhino inside connects to Revit. Um, it doesn't sort of bypass any of those things, you kind of need all five. Um, but once you have that set up, you know, you can sort of remix it a little bit. You could deploy, you could have hops ping a centralized server instead of a local host. Um, yeah, I, I think that's it. Does that answer the spirit of the question? I hope so. Okay. <laughs> if not, you'll, you'll ping us back. Yeah, yeah if, if not, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to chat about this stuff. Uh, with that being said, I'd love to open it. Uh, questions. Yeah, we'll take the first one over here. Um, shout it and we'll repeat it. So I'm just curious what you think about the future of this sort of in house professional or semi professional life development. Do you think years from now we'll see that mainstream and we'll be seeing the new managers kind of the expected role in office? Or do you picture continuing to be kind of building? I think our current model and current thinking is, you know, proving ground to do the development and make sure that we have solid solutions and then to look for markets and customers uh, outside of the traditional Thornton Tomasetti consulting model. So to, to paraphrase the question a little bit, make sure we get it right. That's all right. Uh, is kind of what is the future of kind of the in-house development versus kind of external development? Is that where we're going? Yeah. Will it be a mainstream role within the firm? Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess what I would say is across the institute, will it be an expectation? Okay. I think you touch on this too, Shane. Like, how does a how does a, an organization leverage their data uh, differently? And I think like, you know, the APIs and certainly the machine learning models are like drawing on probes of institutional data and generated data. So I think there's a future there too of like mature data strategies and implementations of those that actually start to deliver some of that institutional knowledge to different markets. I would answer that there's two things I would say to that. First of all, um, 
I would say the work that some of us are doing within the design technology field will gradually grow into a broader operational conversation about the firm. And that's where things like the data about the performance of, a, of, uh, of an entire studio or looking at past projects or understanding the overlap between model quality, staffing, resourcing, fee earning, all of that stuff will ultimately lead to predictive analytics so you know how to fee, put a fee schedule together for your next bid. So right there, you're automatically connecting a whole lot of data within your organization to be able to better inform the performance of your organization. So I would argue within a certain size firm and above that thinks this sort of thing's important, it's going to grow and it's gonna to continue to grow and it'll become broader and it'll be part of an organizational wide strategy. That being said, um, there are always going to be firms out there where they may have priorities in other areas, and they're going to be working with consulting companies to be able to provide these sort of services or build these tools, or they may have some of their own in-house people, but they want to supercharge it by bringing in a proving ground or somebody else to go through and actually build out something more robust. Those sort of companies external to organization have a benefit because they've had their hands in lots of organizations. So they've seen comparatively what other organizations are doing to be able to put together what they think is the best of the best breed. Each of these has their benefit. So what I would say is that I don't think you'll see a shift in one particular direction of these two. I would say that you're going to see an increase of both of them simultaneously. Yeah, I would echo that. I think that, you know, Moving forward, um, and even now, right, to a certain degree, having these in-house initiatives is a differentiator. Um, firms that want to see themselves as kind of uh, innovative or on the cutting edge, firms that want to be at the very kind of pinnacle are investing in these initiatives. But there are plenty of firms that are, you know, have perfectly valid business models that don't include that kind of work. Um, and they, you know, they're not exclusively um, on the on the lower side of the innovative spectrum, but um, I think as we as we move forward, we'll probably continue to see that. Um, for I think a lot of firms, it's kind of an imperative to invest in these sorts of things and to maintain at least some in-house initiative to have um, innovation and development, because we don't want the you know the APIs of the world to come and eat our lunch. We have to sort of like that, that is the, the shark that's sort of chasing us. And we have to kind of stay far enough in advance of that, that we can coexist. Um, but I don't necessarily know that it's all going to kind of go that direction of being totally in-house. I'd like to extend that question to uh, Mr. Hiroyoshi. As part of his presentation was past, present, and future, uh, as you're developing kind of the roadmap for the future of at Chimizu, what, how do you see the team evolving? How do you see the efforts evolving? How do you see the, the firm evolving? Hi, uh, thank you for the question. えっとですね。まあ、今までの質問の流れも少し含めてお答えします well, uh, I would like to also uh, make some comments about what has been discussed um, among the panel. So you were talking about uh, how to inherit or pass on the knowledge and skill sets uh, to the future generation. Uh, the company Shimizu uh, believes that uh, we can only do that uh, utilizing a digital trans a transformation or technology as well. はい。で、え、デザインファーム、あの、設計部門としてはですね、今日ご紹介しましたように、あの、本当にま、ゼロから、え、教育する。この強みは、あの、自分たちのその持っているノウハウを自分でこう、ま、吐き出せる。え、これが知識の伝承に、いずれこう、本当に強みを発揮するんじ
えー、まさにあのご紹介した通りそのコアスタジオの、えー、力があってここまで来れて今まさにあのいろいろ協力をいただいていることでですねどんどん先の可能性にこう明るいこう、えー、未来をこう感じながらですねでもっともっとというところで、えー、例えば今日ご紹介した人流データみたいな、えー、ああいう,こう持っているデータをですねどんどん今増えようとしているこれを使って何ができるかこれを皆さん、えー、今日ご参加の皆さん,、えーなんとですね、あの一緒にできればというコラボレーションを求めています。こういったそのシェアリングとコラボレーションが非常に大きな力になると考えています。Well, um, uh, thanks to a support from Core Studio,、uh, we have been able to actually come to、uh, where we are now, and with the further collaboration,、uh, we believe、uh, that our future is promising, and so、uh, we are evolving pretty strong. And as I mentioned that in my presentation, we have Shimizu data, and、uh, we are seeing that it's expand expanding. And、uh, we are、uh, actually determined to share and collaborate, and so that we'll be able to evolve further. That's all. Thank you. I think there's another question back there. Yes. White shirt, laser. Yes, you. Hi.、Uh, first of all, thanks for the amazing presentation. So I have two point questions. So、with encoding、uh, human machine intelligence terms, encoding biasness in those algorithms, it can be as a procedure as a for data biasness in machines. So, how do you plan to, like, is biasness good or bad? And the second part is about education. So,、uh, I feel、uh, AC in general is very good in marketing and making tips for the tools. But a lot of time, end users are not able to understand the limitations of the algorithms. And I totally understand not every company can be open source. So, can you、uh, share your thoughts on this? To, to paraphrase, it was a two part question. The first part was、uh, with machine learning,、uh, there's essentially training sets that are created, and sometimes they could be biased, sometimes not. Is that bias?、Uh, can it be beneficial? And then the second part is, Uh, with the AEC industry, we create a lot of flashy、uh, images, especially with the GIFs and all. And how can we essentially, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, how can we control user expectations for those that under, don't understand the limitations of the algorithms? Right. I can take the first one,、uh, talking about bias and data sets. Like one of the, the main shortcomings that Rob keeps bringing up with some of the early asterisk data sets is they're not conservative enough. Right, like they, they, they don't,、uh, they're, they're under, like th there's not enough there,、uh, basically. Like they, they're undersized as opposed to being oversized. And from an engineering point of view, the bias is always to tends to be conservative. So I don't know if that exact, I mean, it's, it's a little bit different, Mayor, but like the, the other part of that is when we're doing some of these projects, we're running into teams that are. Incredibly opinionated and adversary about how an engineering problem should be approached.、Um, so that's more of an institutional thing, but、um, certainly something that does bear itself out in the tools for better or worse. I, I think another example of bias on this front has to do from a gender and ethnic perspective.、Um, there's a, a really good book, I'm blanking on the name of the book, and hopefully I get the author's name correct. I think it's、uh, Caroline Criado Perez has a book that talks about. Specifically, this idea of the default male as underpinning every aspect of data gathering that we've had for the last 50 to 100 years. right? Everything down, like the examples that she gives, talks about the design of seatbelts. All are based upon default male. And any of the variations that happen in that data are all in reference to the default male. So that's the starting point. So, what you have to start considering is that we've been gathering data for 50 to 100 years. That's based upon male Western, specifically ethnically Western culture, and with a modernist sort of focus to this. So, we have a lot of problems there. We as architects aren't going to fix this, all right? This is not something that we can fix right away. But what we can start to consider is that when there are opportunities for us to be gathering data, we actually do so in an equitable and a balanced perspective. So, if we're looking to our communities that we're engaging with, 
if we're trying to have that empathy in consideration of that data gathering and analytics that we put together, we have to keep that type of stuff in mind. We have to represent the broader understanding of people in space, not just start with the default male and figure everybody else is a variation off of that. Um, I think on the second question about the, the opening up of the algorithms, this is kind of to my point about the concern about the black box of approaches. I get that there's some special sauce that people put into their tools, right? I understand that. Um, I'm not ex asking for test fit to expose their code, okay? That's not gonna happen, I get that. But an insight into how some of these things are explored. So we understand and I can then look at that and go, okay, this is providing me with a solution that looks pretty good, but I actually think a variation over here might make a little bit more sense because it's given me enough information to activate my thinking, not to shut my thinking down. That's about as far as I think I can, we can expect a commercial company who needs to make a profit and needs to be able to do good business to go. And I'm totally comfortable with that. However, there are other opportunities that we as architecture and engineering practices on things that I would say are arguably not special sauce. This is everybody's stadium bowl generator that's been made for the last 20 years. I've built a few going back to generative components in 2004. So that type of stuff, nobody needs to be um, doing that again. Share this type of information. This is where I applaud a lot of people in the market have been talking about what are the opportunities to share these sort of algorithms and these approaches so we can better improve on it. We're not very good at that. As an industry, we fail at that again and again. We have a hard enough time sharing from project to project and within a larger firm that we're still having trouble sharing broader out there in the market. So this is where marketplaces for applications, algorithms, and ideas, whether you have to pay for them or they're free and open source is ultimately something we absolutely have to do. Otherwise, we're gonna have to be in a default position where a large amount of our industry who can't afford or haven't engaged their own software development teams internally are gonna to have to default to the strategies of larger software companies. And that's just how they're gonna live. I think we benefit as, a, as an industry as a whole to actually challenge that and to give more opportunity and to share that information. Yeah, I, I would mirror that, right? The, the, the most important thing is to remain critical and vigilant, right? To interrogate our data, to think about things, to realize that whatever, there's always going to be a bias for what it's seen before. And so whatever comes out can't be the end of the process. It needs to be the beginning of the process. Um, you need to think about it and, and challenge it. Um, I think in terms of, you know, I remember a couple of years ago, I believe it was here and I believe it was TT had talked about building a, a chat bot that was basically plugged into their, um, uh, HR software so that you could ask it who worked on this project, who has experience in this, who's whatever. And it would basically connect you with other experts that would, you know, such and such worked on this project, such and such is interested in that, such and such is trained on that. Um, I think that that might be one way of actually using some of these, you know, um, machine learning or, or just, you know, kind of big data tools to make your organization feel a little bit smaller, because that is definitely a, a persistent um, problem that we face as, as medium to large size firms is if we all knew what each other know, not the information itself, just aware that it exists within each other's brains, it would be so much more unstoppable. And so I think there's some development that can happen in that direction as well. I'd like to extend the, the question to uh, Hiroyoshi. Hi, thank you for the question. あの、えっとですね、まあ、あの、素晴らしい答えはちょっと私には難しいんですけれども、えっとですね。あの、難しいとは思いつつも我々が考えていることはですね、まあ、AI に、みたいなもの、まあ、ブラックボックスの問題ありますけれども、
answer for that question. Uh, it's a very tricky uh, question to answer. Uh, but this is what I can say. Yes, I understand that there's an issue of black box and whatnot. But uh, what I would like to tell you what we expect on AI. As you know, designers are really busy uh, every day. And we're hoping that AI will be able to actually support uh, them so that they will be able to actually uh, reduce uh, some of uh, the time uh, that uh, will be uh, mundane. Those are same thing. Hi. えー、とともにあの、まあ、クラストマンシップの部分ですねあの我々が持っているその技術我々という言い方も、えー、いろんなそのこう非常に多くの,その層の技術技術層にこう支えられているところがあります、まあ、そういうものをこう取り込んでいくっていうんでしょうかその技術をどうやってその AI の中にいていくかっていうものではあるんですけれども、まあ、そういったこととそのデ,アデザイン支援と。大きなその二つがまあテーマになるんじゃないかと。はい。In addition to the、uh, craftsmanship that we have actually、uh, been accumulated over years, and the question is,、uh, can that be incorporated into、uh, some layers?、Uh, and and so that's something that, that we are also expecting as well. So number one is design designer support, and the other one is what I just mentioned. ということはあれですねあの、コードのシェアとかオープンシェアとか、あ,あのアルゴリズムの共有とか、そういうことは期待しないということですかえっ、ー、とですね、あのまあ、それをどのレベルでやるかという問題ではないかというふうに、個人的には思っています。で、まあ、そういったことをあの、まあ、やらなくていい、ブラックボックスでいいというわけではないですし、まあ、あのそれでトレーニングができない、教育できないということも非常に多くあの議論されています、社内でも。えー、なんですけれどもあの、ユーザーにとってはそういうことをいちいち悩まない方がいいという議論もあったと思います。それもその通りだと思っています。So,、uh, to the question of the, whether we actually want the、um, you know, uh, open algorithm uh, or sources or not. So,、uh, it is really difficult. But personally,、uh, I think uh, uh, we, we have actually had some discussions in the company that、uh, whether that the、uh, black box itself is really good or not, because、uh, it's really hard to educate and train our employees、uh, uh, if it actually remains a black box. Uh, but uh, what we really uh, want uh, is uh, just、uh, how easy it is for the users to use. And I think there was someone also、uh, made some comments about that too. I hope I, I answer your question. Perfect. Thank you.、Um, with that being said, I want to give a round of applause to the audience, to the speakers.